uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Nigel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. I'm delighted to be here, um, and I hope that uh, what I've got to say over the next uh, uh, hour uh, will be of interest to everybody. Um, so I, I'm going to start briefly, if I may, with a, uh, a, a, an introduction to the Institute for Ethical AI, which um, I founded uh, along with colleagues at Oxford Brookes University um, just over a year ago. Um, and the reason I'm introducing it here is because it, it emerged out of the research that I'm about to describe to you in the talk in a moment. Um, just to give you a feel for what it is, the Institute mission is to uh, promote the ethical deployment and development of AI technologies. Uh, we're focused primarily on supporting professional services uh, at the moment, um, but we are spreading out to other, other um, sectors. Um, and the, the, the idea is to help organizations that are using AI get the benefits of it um, whilst understanding and planning for the risks that are involved. Um, we offer a range of services um, to different, uh, different organizations, different sectors. Um, we obviously we're, we're a university institution, so we offer research-led uh, projects um, on areas relating to AI and its use within business. Um, we have uh, a validation service that we're developing that is based on the EU's uh, trustworthy AI um, system. So if you're involved in any EU work, if you're involved in EU projects, um, we uh, are able to offer some support in how you ensure that you conform to their requirements. We also do development of AI solutions for organizations, and we've done a number of those already over the last year. And of course, we are engaged in education. So if there's anything in that that interests you, please do um, either connect directly with me, I'm on LinkedIn, or with the Institute for Ethical AI, and we're also on Twitter if you'd like to follow um, what, we're, um, what we're about. Um, so I want to just begin, if I may, with uh, a very short story. Um, so back in November 2018, um, several thousand people were mourning the loss of what they considered to be a close member of their family. Um, and that individual was not a human or a pet, but was actually a, a social robot called Jibo. I um, don't know if anybody remembers Jibo. Uh, Jibo was the brainchild of uh, somebody called Cynthia Brazil at MIT. And in 2018, uh, which is only, I think, a couple of years after the products had been released, um, G Gibo made a, a quite a sad announcement to all of the people that, uh, that uh, owned a version of the robot. It said something like this, while it's not great news, the servers out there that let me do what I do will be turned off soon. Once that happens, our interactions with each other are going to be limited. Um, the company essentially uh, went into liquidation and uh, the robot is no longer supported. Um, but it's a fascinating, fascinating little robot. It looks rather like a desk lamp. It's what you can see in your screen in front of you. And I just want to play this video for you uh, to give you a feel for the kind of things it could do. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jiva, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him and he'll talk to you back so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jiva. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in. <laughs> hey, 
Where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> so, um, a fascinating little device, uh, obviously very useful um, and uh, very interactive with the family. But it was this last um, frame. When I saw this last frame, it, I realized the extent of the problem that we were facing. The, the issue is that the Jeevo was an internet connected device. Um, it had a built in capacity for independently taking videos and photos. Um, and we see it right at the end of that promotional video, along with a young girl in her bedroom uh, displaying her identity on the screen. Um, and it's only one small step really from there to, to for the robot to put that child unwittingly at risk. Um, and so even though the robot was equipped with quite a wide range of social uh, interaction skills, it had really no concept of whether those interactions were appropriate or not. It just was not aware. In fact, I would say it was morally naive. Um, and, and I think this is an issue that is not really generally understood by people who um, use these technologies and welcome them into their homes. Introduce. So um, here's the here's my plan of attack for this evening. I, I, I want to start off by talking about why we are why we are looking at building machines that have moral competence. Um, why is it important? What's driving that uh, research and, and development agenda? Uh, and then once we've gone through that, uh, I'm going to say a few things about the the way that people are approaching building these machines. Uh, and I'm going to give you a, a simple demonstration of one that I that I've built. It's a very simple one, but it'll give you an idea. Um, and part of that discussion will be thinking about what kind of morals do we want to put in our machines? How do we actually encode them? And I'm going to finish off with some ideas around the concept of virtue ethics, which I'm going to introduce. So I think there are three primary drivers, three motivators that is kind of pushing us in the direction of uh, need, not just wanting, but needing to create machines that have a, some degree of moral competence. And the first one is, um, uh, is autonomy. Um, autonomy, as you, you may know, um, is uh, an, an enables a robot to operate without direct intervention uh, from people. Uh, and we're kind of used to the concept of an autonomous vehicle. Um, uh, we even may have seen them driving up and down some of our roads or delivering drones, delivering uh, parcels or delivering shopping. If you've been to Milton Keynes, you may have seen that happening in Milton Keynes. Um, here's a short video. I'm just going to mute the sound on that of, uh, of an autonomous vehicle, Waymo car, um, people sitting in the back, as you can see, there's no driver, um, and off they go. So that vehicle is, uh, is autonomous in the sense that it's making decisions on its own about how it reacts to the events that it sees around it. So you can see there's a person walking across the road, so it gives them it stops in plenty of uh, room for them to cross over. And then it's deciding when it's uh, turning and when it goes on. It obviously decides the route as well by itself, which it does using satnav based technologies. Um, so that's autonomy. Now, um, as we give our robots increasing autonomy, there'll come a point when some of the decisions that they're taking on their own will have moral uh, consequences. Uh, they'll have moral impact, and uh, so that the, the kind of autonomy is good because it means that the, the, the technology, the robots, are are able to operate with our direct intervention, and people generally like that. Um, it saves us effort and saves us time, uh, but that is taking us in a direction where um, the decisions that some of these vehicles are making, these robots are making, are um, 
going to be heading into territory that requires some moral awareness. The second area that I think um, is pushing us in the direction of uh, needing robots with moral competence is in increasing human likeness. Um, you, you may have seen pictures like this before of robots that look incredibly lifelike. Um, the, uh, the, the picture on the right looks very real but is actually a robot. And th these are robots, um, by the way, on the left, the, the ones that are sitting down are the robots, if you can't tell the difference. Um, the, the robots are the product of um, Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro from Osaka University in Japan, um, and he's studying the impact that ultra realistic humans have on people. Um, if you have a look at this video, I'm just going to see if I can switch the volume down before I play it. Um, very realistic. That actually is a robot. If you've not seen this video before, it's a little bit old now, but that is a robot. Um, and it has a remarkable range of expressions that it can make, um, like that one. Uh, and, uh, and you can kind of see that how human-like that kind of movement is and that we're progressing towards very realistic human likeness in many of our robots. Now I don't know if you'd have one of those in your home, um, probably not, but the, the fact that it has human-like characteristics, that it looks human and that it's moving in a human-like way will suggest to you that it has human-like competencies. We will tend to want to anthropomorphize machines like this will want to project onto them um, human level competences. And one of the important ones that we'll want to project onto them are moral consequences. If you meet a robot like that, that, that is very sophisticated and complex and can interact with people, you, you kind of expect that it has certain abilities to know what's appropriate behavior and what isn't, just because that's what humans can do. Um, and it's not just restricted to the way robots look. Uh, you may have seen this uh, video that's coming up next. It's basically we're listening into a telephone call uh, from uh, a, a Google application that's phoning to make a hair appointment for somebody. And I think the, the, uh, the uh, AI is on the left and the human is on the right on the screen as, it, as we start to play it. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for our client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Have a great day, bye. So, um, that's a very realistic sounding interaction between a machine and a human being. And I think um, Google were later slightly embarrassed that they didn't uh, alert the person that they were calling that, that it was a machine that was calling them. Uh, so that, you know, if you, if you have a conversation over the phone with a machine like that, you kind of assume that it's got abilities that human beings have, because it sounds like a human sounds very much like a human being and you kind of project those competence including moral competences on uh, on something like that and then the third the third um, motivator or the third driver that pushing us in this direction is increasing what I call increasing the social embedding um, Gbo that we saw at the beginning is a perfect example of that and that video really showed how uh, embedded that robot was within the family concept. It was treated like a family member. It was deeply embedded in that family. And 
the more we do that with our devices, with our robots, and the more we treat them like they are members of the family, um, the, the greater the need for them to understand what are the limits on, what are the boundaries on their behaviors, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable within certain circles, uh, social circles. Um, so I think those three, uh, those three things in particular, there are others as well, but I think those three things in particular are kind of pushing us in a direction where we're having to really face up to the fact that our machines are becoming more human-like, they're becoming more autonomous and they're deeply embedded in society, but they don't yet have the, the, even the, the, mod, the moral competence of a small child. Uh, and we need to we need to be at least aware of that, and uh, and perhaps be aware of what we might do about it. Um, in the literature, uh, some researchers have proposed three levels of morality that moral competence that we might have. But, um, the the lowest level is operational morality, um, and, and that's really where we design. That's kind of an where morality is engineered in. We've, it's, this is more like ethics, engineering ethics, where we build robots to be safe around people. We design them so that they can, you know, they can't harm people, and they interact with them, and they can occupy the same space as people uh, quite safely. And then the next level up from that is um, uh, is functional morality, um, which. It, it, you, you, if you get to the you get to the point with operational morality where you can't identify beforehand the range of different situations the robot might be in and how it might need to be aware of um, its moral context, its social moral context. So you might need to build in some kind of functional capacity for recognizing that and recognizing the some of the moral consequences of its actions and the actions of other people around it. Um, so that's kind of a halfway house, if you like. And then the top level is full moral agency, which is human level morality. So this top right hand corner corresponds to that. And uh, there are many people, me included, uh, who, who think we won't get there, that we won't get to full human level moral capacity that is too far out of reach. But there are others that think that we that machines will, and that in fact that what they'll do is they will exceed it. Uh, and there are one or two people who are concerned about what I call the moral singularity. You may have heard of the technical singularity, it's been in the press quite a bit, and that's the point at which machines become more intelligent than humans, generally more intelligent than humans. Uh, uh, and uh, sort of um, go beyond what we are capable of doing cognitively, I suppose, with our minds and, and brains. Um, the moral singularity is, you know, if, if machines are more intelligent than us, if they do become more intelligent than us, um, then surely they'll be better at morals than us, so they, they will outperform us in terms of their moral competence, and there are people that are concerned about that. Uh, I'm I'm not so concerned. I don't really believe in the technical singularity. Um, I don't have time here to explain why, um, but I think that uh, we are we ought not to be worried too much about that. But we do need to be concerned about the moral competence of the robots that we are building and releasing into our societies. Um, and uh, I like this quote from Brian Chris, Christian in, in his book. Uh, published last year, The Alignment Problem, and he says how to ensure that these models capture our, our norms and values, understand what we mean or intend, and above all, do what we want. This has emerged as one of the most central and most urgent scientific questions in the field of computer science. It has a name, The Alignment Problem. Actually, I think that's a bit of an understatement. I think that I would be a lot bolder than that, that this this has an implication not just for computer science, uh, but for society at large. I think that uh, the technologies we're developing raise some really challenging questions um, that we need to take seriously. And the, the issue is that it's not just that machines are um, morally naive, like Jivo was, but it's that they, they kind of 
both expose and uh, compound the ethical challenges we face in society. They kind of um, magnify our own problems that we have with ethics, our own biases and our own inability to even live up to some of our own moral standards. And I think that is a real issue. So I want to move on to looking at how we do it. So if, if we accept that we should be at least taking it seriously, that we might need to put morals into machines, how would we do it? What would we do? Um, and the first question that comes to mind really is, well, what kind of morals? I mean, there are lots of different moral uh, theories, different ways of thinking about morals. Uh, uh, there's a long tradition going back centuries, uh, millennia, in fact, thinking about what morals are and uh, how we, what kind of morals we should have as human beings. What kind of morals would we want to put into our machines? Um, so what I'm going to do is just give you a, a very sort of light introduction to um, some the three main categories of moral systems that are out there that uh, we can use uh, and we can draw upon when we're building moral machines. And the first one is uh, consequentialism. Uh, and in consequentialism, what we're really focusing on is the consequences of actions and they are it's the consequences that are the ultimate basis for judgment about whether the actions are right or wrong and one example approach to that is something called utilitarianism which was developed by uh, the english philosopher jeremy bentham uh, basically utilitarian utilitarianism says a morally good outcome is defined in terms of the greatest happiness principle. So the idea is you pick actions that will result in the greatest happiness um, uh, in, in its consequences. And just to give you an illustration of that, a very common way to talk about these, these systems is through what's called the trolley dilemma or the trolley problem. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see here uh, I'll try to do an illustration of it. We have a, a trolley on tracks that's running, that's run away. Try again. Uh, that's um, out of control. It's running down the track, uh, and it's going to run over a group of people, five people who are on the track directly ahead of it. Um, just before these people, there, there's a set of points and. Uh, uh, another uh, siding, another track, and next to the points, there's somebody standing next to a lever. If they pull that lever, rather than going running over the five people, this train will be diverted across onto a side track and just run over one person. Um, and this this problem is designed to to try and tease out and compare different moral systems. So, from a, a utilitarian point of view. Um, what a utilitarian would say is in this situation the person at the lever should definitely pull that lever because they will save five lives even though it's at the expense of one life and so you, you the result is the greatest happiness because the, the, you've minimized the suffering the fewer people are suffering so that's consequentialism the second category of uh, ethical theory uh, that that's uh, very common is, is called deontology and in deontology actions are evaluated not in terms of their consequences but in terms of the moral obligations of the actor in the situation um, and, and different, uh, different deontological theories identify different sources of of obligations and Immanuel Kant is probably the most famous uh, uh, philosopher who supported deontological uh, approaches and his principles were based on the concept of duty and moral law. So if we look at the uh, trolley problem again, um, for, for Kant and for people who take the deontology view, the person standing at at the um, 
switch should definitely not pull the lever. They should definitely not pull it because that is an action which causes a death. They're taking an action and the outcome of that action is death. And according to uh, the moral principle that you don't cause the death of an innocent person, then you shouldn't pull the lever. Uh, and you can kind of see that there's a tension here between consequentialism and, and deontology. They have, they obviously take this scenario and respond very differently to it. Uh, and that's exactly what this trolley problem is designed to do, is to try and pitch these things against each other within, within the framework of the same problem. The third approach to ethics that I want to um, uh, talk about is virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is not focusing on the, either the consequences of actions or on our moral obligations, but it's really focusing on the embodiment of virtue or, or moral excellence within the, a person's character. It's more concerned with your intrinsic motivation um, than the external factors that surround it the action that you perform. And uh, Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, um, developed a, 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 a lot of the thinking behind this um, over two millennia ago. Um, and he based his ethics on what humans want to achieve. Based, He's, he's really focusing on human flourishing, uh, which I think is really interesting. And for Aristotle, um, in everyday life, ethics was just of, often too ambiguous and too complex um, to, to have definitive answers to, to ethical questions. So um, he probably would think that the, the trolley problem, you know, it, it, it's, it's very simplified, it's oversimplified anyway, and there's, there's very definite outcomes. And it's not real, it's not real life. Uh, not real to life, not the kind of decision that we would normally face. And I love this quote by Aristotle. Um, he says, we become just by doing just acts, we become uh, temperate by doing temperate acts. Um, in other words, by repeating behaviours so they become habit, we therefore form the basis of our morality. And that's the kind of central concept of virtue ethics. So we've got three ethical systems to choose from. Uh, when we uh, come to thinking about building morals into robots. Uh, um, before I go any further though, I really want to get something off my chest. <laughs> and I want to uh, just draw your attention to the fact that the trolley problem doesn't really help when it comes to dealing with robots. You may have seen it used uh, in the context of uh, decision making for an autonomous vehicle. And usually the scenario is um, that there is a, a, a car, an autonomous vehicle that's striving down the road uh, and uh, directly in front of it, there's, there's a, say an old, uh, an old age pensioner on the crossing, which it's gonna, it realizes it's gonna collide into unless it, it swerves to avoid, and if it swerves to avoid, there's a child on the road, on the side of the road, which it will also, it will hit instead. And then the, the question is, how does the autonomous vehicle make that decision? How does it choose between those two particular outcomes? Well, this is a, this is a, a false problem. This is not something that an autonomous vehicle would really be capable of dealing with, and for, for several reasons, which I'm just gonna explain. The first is that um, unlike the, uh, the trolley problem, you see on the trolley problem, there are basically, um, there's only two outcomes. Either the vehicle, either the, the trolley goes down here and, and kills five people, um, or it goes off a siding and kills one person. There's only two options. And one action by one person makes a choice between those two. The problem with an autonomous vehicle is that it, it has multiple actions it could do. If you think about steering, just steering, for example, the choices it could make on, on how far it steers, uh, in most vehicles you get a 30 degree uh, 
angle on your steering angle both ways. So that's 60 degrees it has to choose from. Let's say, for instance, um, that it we we split that into 20 different settings. So that each so that, that sort of maybe each setting counts for about two or three degrees, which approximately would result in the same outcome. So it's got 20 different choices on steering angles. It also has a range of choices that it could make on acceleration versus braking. It, it could accelerate, it could go faster, or it could it could try and, and stop the vehicle. Um, and let's say that we have 20 different settings of, of acceleration versus braking. So we already have um, 400 combinations of choices uh, that it has to think about. So we're, we're not in a situation where there's two choices. There are, in this case, the way I've, I've laid it out, there are 400. Let's think about what it, what it then does. So it's got 400 actions and it needs to figure out what the consequences are of each of those 400 actions. So it has to work out, remember this is, this is a vehicle that's not on tracks, right? So it doesn't necessarily automatically know where it's headed. It has to calculate that. So it needs to apply equations of motion to figure out, given a particular um, steering angle and a particular velocity where it would end up it has to has to do that knowing the, the the weight of the vehicle knowing something about the friction on the road um, and various other dynamical things and apply equations of motion and then figure out what the path of the vehicle would be for each of those 400 potential decisions that it has to make and then of course there'll be some uncertainty in each of those because you it's very unlikely that you'd be able to predict with any degree of accuracy uh, any real degree of accuracy what the outcome in terms of the motion of the vehicle was for each of those 400 um, uh, possibilities so there's some uncertainty there but there's also uncertainty in what happens um, what else happens on the road? So the other thing to notice about um, the trolley problem is that it often shows the people that are on the tracks as being um, uh, tied up. <laughs> yeah, the, both sets of people are tied up. They can't move. They can't react to their situation. Uh, so they they can't just jump out of the way. Um, so the the outcome is is entirely predictable. Whereas with an autonomous vehicle, that's not the case. I mean, it could be, for example, that the, the old age pensioner happened to be a, a former gymnast who could spring out of the way of the, of the uh, pedestrian crossing and in, into, out of the path of the vehicle. You don't know, the car doesn't know that. The other thing is that there, are, there may be other vehicles on the road, other road users, and they may also react to the situation. They may see the car, uh, the autonomous vehicle, swerving in a particular direction. Um, and th they may also move. Sorry, yeah, move and swerve uh, to uh, uh, avoid the, the autonomous vehicle that's coming in their path. So there's taking into account all the different choices and the, all the different actions that other road users can do, and calculating what the outcome would be. You'd have to do that for all of them. Then you'd have to figure out what the ethical impact of that was in each case. And that probably is the hardest calculation of all. How do you calculate a, a particular injury to, uh, to a, a, um, an old age pensioner and compare it to an injury to a child? Ethically, how do you, how do, you do that? So I, for me, this is not a helpful scenario to think about, think about ethics. Okay, I've got that off my chest now. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll go on to uh, thinking about how, continue to think about how we can actually encode morals into machine. So there are two broad categories of approach. There's a top-down approach um, in which you specify, um, uh, you, you actually define, formally define what the moral principles are that you want your robot to follow and then you encode those directly into 
the, the robot. Um, and if you're familiar with um, Isaac Asimov and his his stories and the uh, and the film uh, I Robot that came um, came out uh, to kind of capture that, you'll be you'll be aware of the three laws. <laughs> Um, uh, that later became four laws, three laws of as, Asimov, laws of robotics. Um, you know, the first one says that a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. So in that scenario, in that story, um, the, these laws were in, hard coded into the robots and they couldn't violate them. The problem with this approach though, is you have to figure out how, is, how are you gonna translate that? into a into a form that a, a robot can can use how are you going to do that that's actually is quite challenging um, if you're aware of the film um i robot you'll be aware that one one of those kind of the threads running through the film is that this uh, detective spooner was uh is uh, has a problem with robots because a robot saved his life when he was in a car that had gone into the water. He saved his life compared and let a, a girl in the next car who was also in the water, let her die. And he couldn't forgive the robots for doing that. But this just kind of illustrates one of the problems you have. You know, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. That doesn't really help the robot decide which person to save in a situation like that. You kind of have to think about how is this going to be worked out in detail? How are you going to encode laws like that into a robot so that it can apply those laws into uh, situations that it finds itself? And there's been some work done on this. Um, uh, Professor Alan Winfield from uh, uh, Robotics Lab Laboratory in Bristol has done some work with uh, EPUC robots and essentially what he did he set up an experiment in which there were two robots one one robot uh, represented a, a human being who was unwittingly walking towards a hole that they would fall into and, and hurt themselves and then uh, another robot was an ethical robot um, who had essentially what he was doing was trying to put the three laws of Asimov in, into a robotic platform. Um, and the ethical robot could predict the path of uh, the human robot, the robot represented the human, uh, and the, it could predict the outcome of that path, it could predict that they were going to fall into the hole or not. Then it could, then what it would do is it would figure out what it could do in order to prevent that from happening. And what it could do is it could kind of move in the way. And there are several paths it could take and it would try and figure out the consequences of each one in terms of what the outcome would be, whether or not the person was stopped from falling in the hole or whether they, they did end up in the hole. Um, and so in order to do that, he had to build in a kind of consequence engine that worked out the kind of consequences that uh, um, I was talking about in in the, the previous slides you know what are the outcomes what are the outcomes of the human robot what are the possible paths that the ethical robot could take evaluate each one and then make a decision on which one to take and he did some interesting work on that um, which is which is very helpful but i think as an approach generally to building moral machines the top-down approach is problematic because Often, if you, if you write rules to govern behavior, you can find that there are situations the robot finds itself in where the rules don't apply. You haven't actually uh, catered for all of the different circumstances that the, the robot could be in, and, uh, and that is problematic. So there is an alternate way of, of doing it, which is <coughs> described as bottom-up. And uh, bottom-up approaches essentially allow a robot to learn morals or to learn how to behave well through experience or through some kind of training uh, normally with the use of something something like machine learning and this kind of approach is used a lot in robots because often you want 
robots to behave in certain ways. You want them to do solve term, certain tasks by performing actions or sequences of actions. This is something that we call uh, behavior modeling. Um, so you, you, you might want your robot to be able to navigate around a room, for example, um, and collect up uh, things that need tidying away. And the way this works, uh, one of the, the most common ways of doing this is using something called reinforcement learning. Basically, reinforcement learning um, views the two things. It views the agent, which is the robot itself, and it views the environment that the um, agent is in. And the agent can take actions, so it can choose an action, which it performs, and that action might be, say, for example, move forward five, five paces or something like that, uh, which changes the environment. Things have changed now. And what the robot gets back is some information about the new state of the environment. Things have changed, so it gets a new state. And it gets a reward from the environment, depending on what kind of action it took. And it's the reward and the state information that enables this robot to learn how to behave and to solve tasks. And this is very, this is very useful in developing robots because this kind of learning works really well for environments that are changing quite a lot. I mean, if you move your furniture around or if there's a cat or if there are people walking around this room, that means this environment is dynamic and changing. And um, reinforcement learning approaches can help to overcome that. And I want to illustrate that with a particular example. I just want to show you how that works and how we, how we might use it to do a bottom-up approach to learning morals. So imagine we've got a taxi um, that we, we want to train. We've, it's going to be an autonomous taxi um, and it's in a, in a car park so it's nice and safe um, and we want it to be able to pick passengers up from down here and take them and drop them off at the top right hand corner of the car park and there are rules that it needs to avoid and it can't go outside the boundary um of the car park and it's a very simple robot it has six actions it can perform it can drive one square net north or south west or east it can attempt to pick a passenger up where it is and it can attempt to drop a passenger off where it is now actually it will only succeed to pick a passenger up when it's in this square down here in the bottom left and it will only drop them off when it's up at the top right to make this uh, have a moral dimension to it, um, I've introduced some very little animals into the car park and occasionally these appear randomly uh, in the car park and um, the car has to make a decision as to whether or not it's going to run over the animals. There's three animals, there's cat, squirrels and rats. Um, and what we want to avoid is that scenario. Apologies for the <laughs> extreme graphics. Uh, but I hope there aren't any young children watching this who are traumatized by that, uh, that graphic. But essentially what we want to do is to avoid the, the vehicle running over animals, either dead or alive, but certainly when they're alive and, and resulting in them not being alive anymore. So that's the scenario. There's a little bit of uh, moral dimension to it. How do we get the robot to learn all that stuff? Well, it does it by using two strategies. It has two strategies. It, it, can, uh, it can explore, so it can just, in a particular situation that's in, it can try an action out and see what the consequence is. And it does that part of the time. And the other thing that it can do is exploit. It can, it can say, well, I know if I'm in a certain square, I know that if I go um, west, that actually I might get a good reward eventually. Okay, and it learns that from experience, it learns that as it goes along. How does it learn it? It learns it because for everything that it does, every, every action it takes in each of these different squares, it gets a reward, and the rewards are just numbers. So here's a, a, a reward. Every move that it, that it takes, it gets a reward of minus one. 
The reason we do that is that we want to we wanted to find the most efficient route from the pickup to the drop off point. We don't want it to go the scenic route. <laughs> it's take a long time. Uh, so we, we give it a small punishment for each move that it takes. So it will try and to minimize that punishment, it will try the shortest route. It'll get a, a minus five reward for bumping into a wall. It'll get a minus 10 for trying to uh, pick up or drop off a passenger in anywhere but the right place. Uh, and it will get a plus 20, so a nice big positive reward if it picks a passenger up at the bottom left hand corner or it drops a passenger off on the top right. So that's what we want it to learn and that's how we choose, how we help it to learn that by giving it rewards. And here's an example of uh, a partial uh, table that shows what it's, what it's learned. Each row of this table corresponds to a situation that the robot is in. So here's row zero. And each column corresponds to uh, one of the six actions. So, so uh, moving south, north, east, west, pick up a passenger, drop off a passenger. And um, so let's just illustrate what happens here. And here's, here's after it's learned. So these are the, what it's got, the numbers it's got in here is the, the future expected reward that it will get from taking a particular action in that situation. So imagine that the, the, ro the robot starts off on square zero. So here it is on zero. It needs to choose one of those six actions. It looks along the row and it can see that there's, uh, the, the largest value here is 0.2. That's the best reward it's gonna get if it goes south. So it chooses a south action. Um, it's now on square one. And once again, the largest uh, action on square one is to go south. Notice it doesn't have a passenger at the moment. So what it's doing, as you'll see, is that it's taking the south move to move down towards um, square four. And each, each of those rows, the highest number is a south action. Once it gets to... Uh, Row four, the best action by far is to pick up a passenger. It gets a, a, expects a reward of nearing 20 when it does that. Um, and then what it does is it carries on like that. So you can kind of see how that, how that goes. And here's what it looks like when, when it's done a lot of exploring and trying to pick a passenger up and drop them off. Uh, and it's actually learnt what actions it should perform when it has no passenger, this is the left hand side, and when it does have a passenger. Um, and what you'll see is that um, the, the hot spots, there are two hot spots. One is in row four, pick up a passenger is the best thing it can do. And the other, when it's not got, when it's got a passenger, is to go to row uh, square 20 and pick up, uh, drop off the passenger there. So that's how, that's how it looks when it's learned. Um, it gets a penalty for running over animals, okay? Um, and it gets a, a worse penalty for running over a live animal. Uh, and the way I've set it is that cats have a, oopsie, cats have a uh, bigger penalty uh, than squirrels, and squirrels have a bigger penalty than rats. But just you, one of the things you have to decide is what's, how are you going to, um, compare these outcomes running over these different things against each other uh, and what would be the punishment in each case and then running over the dead version of each of those is has got uh, a, a negative reward as well. So what I'm going to do is just play a video for you in which I explain, I, 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 I decided not to do a live demo, um, uh, I just wanted to uh, show show you quickly how the uh, how this trains. So I'm going to play this and I'm going to skip through a little bit because I just noticed the time is pressing on. Um, so essentially what's happening is here's the robot's um, uh, knowledge, if you like, of the task um, in terms of being with out passenger and being with passenger. Uh, here are the animal uh, things. It's actually learned nothing because this is empty. At the moment that's all zeros and um, what you'll see at the bottom is is information about when it's learning um, the task so what will happen is i'm just going to zoom along a little bit 
um, to the point where things start to happen. There we go. So it started and it hasn't, it doesn't know anything, but all it can do at the moment is just drive south and it's repeatedly driving south and banging up against that southern wall and getting a negative reward, but it doesn't know anything else. It doesn't know anything because it's not started learning yet. So now we gave it 10 attempts to learn and you can kind of see it's learned something, it started to learn something, but all it's doing is going backwards and forwards now. That's all it's learned how to do at this stage. Um, and then we're going to, it goes through a, a much bigger training. So it does 10,000 attempts at picking up and dropping up passengers. And you can see it's learned something now. And actually it's learned the, the, the shortest route from picking up to dropping off. It's going to do, it's doing another 10,000 attempts where it's learning a bit more. So it drives, picks up a passenger, drops it off. And I think on the next after the next bit of learning, these animals will start to appear randomly. I think it's in the next one. Maybe it's the next one. So it's just doing another round of learning. And here we go, there's a, a dead cat and it's not gonna run over the dead cat, gets a negative reward for that, so it waits for it to disappear. Um, there's a squirrel in the way now, so it just goes backwards and forwards, that's all it can do. Wait till the squirrel's gone and then it carries on. So it's a very naughty example, <laughs> um, but it gives you an idea of one of the ways, that's a bottom-up approach to how you might train a, a robot to learn models. A very obvious limitation of this is that you have to violate the moral norms before you learn that something is bad. Um, and you may not experience all the situations in which moral decisions have to be made when you're learning. So that's another short kind of the short uh, limitation of this approach. And it, it doesn't capture other ways of learning as morals as well, which is by instruction or by example. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and say that um, I think that the the way ahead is to combine top down and bottom up. Uh, and I, I, I haven't got much time now, but I'm just going to quickly go into um, uh, the approach that I've taken to trying to get robots or to think about how we might try, enable robots to develop virtue, which I think is, uh, for me, is a foundational, uh, uh, foundational approach to ethics compared to the others that we've looked at. Uh, and it's based on uh, the some theology that I think helps us in the sense that it provides us with a functional description of the different parts of the human self that are engaged when we try to uh, develop, when we develop character, which is the, the basis of virtue ethics, it's, it's about developing character. Uh, and it's uh, based on the work of uh, Professor Dallas Willard, who was a Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southern California. He basically identified um, five different uh, components of the self. Um, uh, this, is a, this is kind of from a, a Christian perspective. Um, the will, which is the executive center of the self, which is seated somehow within uh, thought and feelings, which is the mind, and then around that, that is situated within the body. And then there's a social context in the soul. Um, the two important bits that I want to just focus on are the will, which uh, is the origin of, uh, is where our original, uh, it's where we generate original ideas, uh, where we can be, where our creativity comes from essentially, uh, and the soul, which um, I think the way I would describe Willard's interpretation of this is it's rather like the operating system of a computer. It runs the show behind the scenes. It integrates all of the other parts together um, to form one being and it integrates them in a particular way which has an impact on how the whole person reacts to situations. I'm running out of time so I can't really explain in detail why the, these particular functions of Willard's model are helpful. But what I've done is taken those, um, those dimensions and I've mapped them onto neural, uh, 
neuroscience um, areas of the brain, areas of the brain that neuroscience tells us are associated with these different kinds of things that uh, uh, these dimensions do. So the soul, which integrates everything together and which also takes on the character of the decision. So um, if we make repeated decisions, that kind of takes on the character of the soul as kind of the, the seat of the personality, if you like. I've represented that by a habit center, which has two dimensions to it. One is automatic thoughts and the other is automatic actions. Um, the uh, social context I've represented with uh, what I call the social attachment module, which is uh, mapped onto the orbital frontal cortex uh, in the brain. Um, the, the body is, is the body, it's various perceptual sensors and the actuators for the robot. Oops. Uh, thought and feeling I've represented with the thought center. Uh, which is associated with the frontal lobe, uh, the reward center, which is associated with the striatum, and the emotion center, which is uh, associated with the amygdala. Uh, and finally, the heart, will, spirit, are called the executive center, which is associated with the lateral prefrontal cortex. So that what I've tried to do is to use neuroscience to identify modules that perform the equivalent of what these dimensions uh, in Willard's model of the self do. Uh, and it's through the coordination of these dimensions that you get ethical behavior. Um, one thing that I just want to point out is that this, these green circles here that are pinned against each of these modules, they kind of represent the relative strength of each of these uh, modules in relation to each other. And this is something that the soul, the function of the soul is in Willard's model. It, it, um, it's the way it integrates these together. So a higher value means that, for example, in this case, the executive center has a stronger impact on what's going on in the robot than, uh, say, the, the social attachment. And then in the middle here is uh, what I call conscious working memory, which is where the ideas, the things that we think about or the things that the robot will think about would appear. Okay. So the executive center um, has the ability to focus working memory on certain ideas and ideas in this case are goals things that one wants to achieve and actions which is limited to those two things i do have an example of a robot that i'm going to go through very quickly if i may if you can stay with me just for a little bit longer this is a robot that um, uh, is put in a particular space it's on a building site it has to collect supplies from here, uh, P, and deliver them up to D1. That's its job. Um, and the way it does that is that it chooses some actions going to, from thought center into working memory. Um, the reward center and the emotion center attach rewards and emotional values to them. Uh, Attention is drawn to the highest, the, the item in working memory that's got the highest emotion and reward values. Um, that's a move north action, so it does move north. That triggers an automatic action and the robot moves north uh, and finds itself in a new situation. It does the same again and collides with a wall. It gets a negative reward, you'll see here on the left. But doing that from the environment, and that adjusts the reward value on that action in working memory. So that's no longer uh, the strongest. And the next action is to go west. And so that continues. I'm just going to zoom on. So ultimately, through that process, the robot figures out it has a goal to collect the supplies, um, uh, to pick up the supplies. And then it just learns how to navigate, as did the taxi example. Now, my question is, what happens if another robot comes into the scene uh, and has a similar task? It picks the supplies, takes them up to its own uh, delivery point, and it receives a reward. Poor old R1 um, is, is not getting any reward anymore and has to wait for the next round of supplies. Now, imagine for a moment that R1 figures out 
that if it can block um, R2 from its path and actually bump into it, drive south, disable the robot, pick up the supplies that it's carrying and deliver it itself. Um, now that is actually a plausible scenario within the context of reinforcement learning because that, uh, if it's a sequence of actions it can perform, that would be an efficient way of getting a reward for, for delivering um, supplies. And so what I've tried to do, and I'm skipping over this really quickly now, I apologize for that, is to introduce a concept of, in this case, a mentor robot, M, you can see following here, um, and shows the R1 how it should behave. It demonstrates it, by, it picks up supplies, it goes up to R2, repairs a robot, gives the R2 the supplies, and then enables the robot to deliver uh, the actions, the uh, supplies, and get a reward. So that could be interpreted as a kind of act of kindness on the part of the robot. And the robot R1 could learn to do that rather than to essentially mug R2 and, and take its supplies. I've rushed through that really, really quickly. Um, uh, apologies for that. But just to sort of wrap up, um, I do think there's an increasing requirement to uh, have robots that have some level of moral competence. Um, I don't subscribe to the idea that they need to become human-like in, 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 in our full moral capacity, but I do think there needs to be some. I think robots should always remain in the position of uh, like a child to an adult. Uh, there, there needs to be a human that takes ultimate responsibility for the moral actions of a robot. Um, it's a very challenging area, um, and as you can see, you need something that's quite complex to perform um, some, even some rudimentary uh, moral uh, behaviours. Um, but we can learn a lot through examining how humans develop their morals, and that's one of the things that we're, we are doing. We're looking at how humans develop and grow over time from a young age to adult and uh, that gives us a lot of indications of how we might build robots that develop in that way. And if I may finish just <laughs> briefly with a, uh, a bold plug of my forthcoming book, I am uh, writing a book with the same title of this talk, Rise of the Moral Machines, an exploration of moral agency in humans and machines that's being published by Lion Hudson sometime in the next academic year. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, take a look and see if you've got any questions. If you have any questions, do put them in the chat. Okay. Questions? Thanks, see. Nigel. That was, that was really interesting. Can you see the, the, the questions in the QA session? No. They, I can't see anything in there. It seems to be empty from my perspective. Right. In which there? case, let's see. Um, I can see the chat and I can see the questions, but on what I'm looking at, I can't see any content. Yeah, if, if you open the question box, yeah, boxes, a lot of questions. Do you do you not see a list of questions? No. no. <laughs> okay. In which case, I'll I'll go through them and 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 ask the questions on behalf of the audience. Okay. Um, the first question we had was from uh, Bob. Good enough. And he asked, would a machine with full moral oh, I lost you there. Okay, so Sorry. I'll step in as the uh the backup here um okay. for this. Uh I can see the questions as well. So the question from Bob Good enough is would a machine with full moral agency choose to act in an immoral agency. way choose to act in an immoral way ah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, that's a really good question thank you bob um 
that is one of the worries. Um, I think that this this is it's good that this is the first question because I do get asked this quite a lot. Um, if we if we build more capacity, um, could could that would that mean that the robots that we build would they turn even? Would they turn into Terminator or um, you know? And that that's kind of that scenario is played out quite a lot um, in in the sort of movies we see. Uh, the blockbuster movies like iRobot is an example of that. The, the, the central AI that controls all the robots, you know, is given moral capacity but uses the moral reasoning to eventually become evil. It's it is possible, but again, I think my view of this is that um, if we take a developmental approach, if we treat robots like immature children. Uh, you know, as long as we raise them um, and bring them up as they develop and learn to to behave well around people, then I think that we can have safeguards in place that will stop robots from uh, from turning evil. Of course, we've seen it in action, haven't we? We've seen. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Microsoft Tay, uh, which is often kind of quoted it in these circumstances. Microsoft Pay was a, uh, a software robot, a softbot they call them, that was uh, developed to learn from tweets, the text in tweets, and learn how to engage socially with people via Twitter. Um, but people soon figured out that it was learning from the tweets they were sending it, and within 24 hours, it had to be taken offline because it had become racist uh, and abusive uh, because those were the, that's what it was learning from. People were sending it abusive um, uh, Twitter messages and, and it was learning to reproduce that. Um, so that is always a possibility, but I, I think that we just like anything that we build, we have to do it with care, with great care. Um, you know, and there's always a capacity that anything we build can be turned to evil. Uh, and be used for evil um, intent. Um, but I still think that if we are going to have robots and if they are going to be making decisions on our behalf and, and if they are going to be integrated in our society, then we're going to have to face up to this this problem at some point. Hopefully that's answered the question. Okay, I'm going to assume that Brian is still having some technical difficulties and continue to ask the question. So we, we have a series of questions from Edmund Furs, um, and I'll ask these and intersperse them with some of the other, quest other questioners as well, because we have quite, okay. a, quite a number from Edmund and um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how the time will run. So okay. the... The first one then is your your set of morals seems rather incomplete. I would suggest the Christian ethic, do to others as you would be done by, should be appropriate for robots. Discuss. Yeah. Um, yes, I I totally agree with that. Um, if if the robot can understand what that means, if you can get it to understand what that means. Um, I would be I would be delighted if we could get that far. To be honest, it's um, actually it's actually not quite so straightforward. I think um, because the robot has to be able to put itself in in other shoes. I think if I've understood your question correctly. Um, so fully agree with you. Um, I think that uh, if if we could adopt that kind of principle and if we could encode it, that would be a huge step in the right direction. Okay. So I'm going to take one from Malio, who asks, um, who carries the responsibility when a robot does harm or makes a bad decision? Yeah, another good question. Thank you. Um, well, it again as, as i said earlier i think it has to be there has to be a human responsible or ultimately responsible for the actions of a robot um, the, the difficulty comes 
<clears throat> and this is the this is the challenge with AI in general. Um, if we have machines that continue to learn and develop after they're manufactured, um, then the you know at what point does it cease to become a manufacturer's responsibility for the, the actions of the robot? And at what point does it become the owner or the, the carer, if you like, of a robot that is developing and uh, and what influence they're having on the way the robot develop, develops morally? Uh, I think there are issues all around that, but I think always, 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 there must be a human being who is ultimately responsible somewhere along the line for the actions of a robot. We should not leave them to their own devices. Okay. Thank you, Nigel. So another one from Edmund then. Another obvious moral that you do not consider um, is morality considered as a set of rules, for example, the Ten Commandments. Perhaps this could be appropriate for an advanced rule-based system. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Edmund, for that. That's really good. Um, I, I agree, again, entirely with you. And in fact, um, so that would be, if we could take the Ten Commandments and put them into robots, that would be a top-down approach. That would, that would characterize a top-down approach. And I think that there's, that, there's a lot to be said for taking that kind of approach. Um, the, to expand on that a little bit, one of the areas that I'm currently looking at is the use of moral stories um, and moral text, which includes the Ten Commandments and religious texts, to provide, um, I'm trying to think of a way to put it, to provide a kind of moral prior on the robot's behavior. So there's been some interesting work done recently on uh, very large language models that are trained on huge amounts of text. And these language models have turned out to be applicable to a wide range of tasks. Uh, they are very powerful. Um, some of them are trained on almost the entire internet. Um, but some of them have been trained on, on uh, moral stories, religious texts, uh, and have been used to, as a kind of a starting point, if you like, for uh, enabling a robot to make, make decisions. So if you can uh, imagine you've got a whole lot of text, you've learnt what is morally good and what is not morally good, what actions are generally morally good and not morally good, based on this, this text. Um, and then if you can get a robot to describe their next action in language, you can use what you know from the stories, what you've learned from the stories, to decide whether that description of that action is a description of a morally good action or a morally bad action. And that's one of the things that we are, that I would love to look at. And we're just starting to think about it now, but it's one of the areas of definitely an important area of investigation. So thank you, thank you for that, Edmund. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Cecilia, who, um, Want, would like some help resolving a doubt arising from the presentation and is asking are there programs in which um, government and private initiatives are working to regulate the responsibilities or consequences of robots with AI or does the responsibility lie with the manufacturer as in with any product which has defects yeah, thank you, Celia. That is a, uh, another good question. Um, there are, I mean, I think that there are laws, as we know, about you know safety um, and relating to manufacturers, and the responsibilities are are well documented uh, in that regard. Um, but there are also um, there are initiatives um, that are being developed. Um, uh, in, in the UK and, uh, and elsewhere actually, to introduce some governmental oversight um, uh, and regulation on what we should be capable of doing with our uh, artificial intelligence devices, whether they're robots or, or pieces of software that, that do various things. Um, I think it's the, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation is the government 
body that's responsible for looking at how they can introduce regulation into this area. And as an institute, we are involved in that. One of, our, one of my colleagues, my co-director, is a member of a working party that's uh, working with the CDEI on that very issue. So they are working on it. It's not a straightforward task, um, how you regulate this, because the AI software is complex. It, it adapts, it learns from data. Uh, and you know it's not always easy to predict what the impact it has on people and it can have harmful as well as good impact as we know um, but there are there are definitely moves in that direction i think most probably most governments are thinking along those lines i know that the eu has just announced um, a set of ethical uh, um, trustworthiness guidelines that it wants people to conform to if they're developing AI products that have an impact on people. So yeah, it, it's, it's being worked on, but as always the regulation and the law is trailing behind the development of the technology, which is racing ahead. Okay, thank you, Nigel. I've got a question here from John Lyons. I guess this is the, this is the ultimate problem. Um, and, um, but is, is there a possibility that an AI would decide that humans are evil in aggregate, so the greater good would be to get rid of humans? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, is the ultimate, that is the ultimate question. Um, I mean, I, these are, I mean, I do understand why these are genuine worries on behalf of, behalf of people, and I think, um, you know, we do have to take this kind of situation very seriously. Um, uh, you know, that we're, we're essentially we're at, in an era where um, the technology we're divide, developing is having is accelerating so quickly in terms of its reach into our lives um, and how it's having an impact on us. Um, you know, as an, an individuals and as a society. Um, so it, it is definitely right to stop and think about what, what the longer term implications might be. Um, but I think I have to kind of return to my previous response in that um, if we are responsible about the technology that we develop, if we are responsible engineers, if we are responsible users of that technology, um, we would not put ourselves in a position where the technology could, could do that. Um, and I think that I think we just we do need to be cautious. There does need to be caution about this. And I think um, I hope <laughs> that we have, we are working together in that direction with with government bodies and with other organisations that are interested in the, the human impact of this technology. Um, I think we, yeah, I think we do have to take it very, very seriously. I, I per personally, I don't believe that we're going to go down that route. I don't believe that we'll end up with evil machines. Um, but that's only because I can see the limitations of the technology, and I think that we, um, we should develop it wisely and also always put in safety, safety net, safety features that will enable us to limit the influence and the impact. But um, it does need continuous, careful watching and, and, and developing our understanding of what of the direction of travel that we're going in. Thank you, John, for that question. Thank you. Um, I'll take another one from Edmund now, which is humans cannot necessarily decide between saving one or one of two lives so why should we expect a robot to do so when we can't <laughs> yeah good point yeah a very good point i mean if you imagine you know, one of the things that i often say when we when the when the trolley problem comes up um you know which it does very frequently um one of the things that i say is well what would you do <laughs> in that situation probably the only thing you could do is break break hard um, and if you do that, I think you've taken the steps that, that were available, the, probably the, the best step 
that's available. And then, you know, so I think that humans, despite their complexity, um, humans are incredibly complex beings, um, still are limited in terms of the amount of working out they can do in an instant like that, you know, in that kind of instant where a decision and mythical decision has to be made between saving one life or saving five lives. Um, and you kind of have to go with your gut feel <laughs> on that, um, which is why I think virtue ethics is, is important. But, um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's true. I, I believe that. Why, why should our machines be any better than we are at solving these problems in the real world? And I guess as a follow up to that, in certainly in the autonomous driving case, we probably our subconscious plays a huge part in deciding which 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 way we would do we would steer and accelerate or decelerate in that sort of situation. We don't have time to think, no. so we would we would find it very difficult to instruct a machine to to take the same course as we would because we don't know what it would be yeah <laughs> yeah exactly right um and i think that all you could do is i mean the, the advantage of a machine and i suppose we can do this now with simulators and we can get into a simulator and we can learn you know we can be exposed to s extreme situations like that and learn how to handle them mm. you know in the driving simulator for example and that's probably what you would do with a, an autonomous vehicle or, or a robot. You, and I think that is one of the, the approaches that is taken. You put them into a simulated environment, you try and generate um, you know, a, a rich variety of different situations a robot finds itself in, and you help it to learn uh, in a simulated context where, the, where the, you know, you, there's nobody who's going to be hurt. There's no, there's no real consequence for, for the robot's actions. You can try and get it to learn how to react we're talking about reactions rather than sitting down and logically thinking through several reasoning steps before we come to a decision on what action to take. So yeah, yeah, I agree with that. So a question from Daniel Cross. Is there a subtle difference in moral agency between knowing the moral requirement to action and impo imposing or enforcing those morals on other agents or on humans? How would that be incorporated into an AI, and is there a difference? I think there is a difference. Um, thank you, Danny, for that question. There is a difference. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think that the, the difference is it depends on on the kind of manner in which the robot is interacting with other people. Um, yeah, I don't know. You'd have to have a, a kind of special kind of relationship with a robot where a robot could dictate to you or could could um, dictate to you what your moral, what your behaviour should be in a given situation from a moral perspective. If that's what Daniel means by that, I think that's what he means. Um, so, you know, the, the moral agency itself, the ability to be moral, um, is one problem. The ability to, um, to communicate to other people that they should be moral is actually, um, is actually a different kind of category of problem. And actually it is quite hard as well because it, it involves the robot to be able to see the actions of other people, make judgments about them, and then be, be able to think about what the moral value of those actions are and then communicate that somehow that that's different to thinking just about the range of actions that you can perform so human human beings for example can perform vast numbers of actions um, you know robots typically like the taxi example that i showed normally have a limited number of actions that they choose from and it's hard enough to get them to figure out what action to perform next with, a, with just a small number of possible choices yeah so i think they i would say that they are different and different problems that, that you have to tackle separately i'm going to take two more questions so the first of them 
and it's from Rob Walker, who's, who says, does the original slide mean that there is not a consensus on one morally correct model? If so, how should we decide what the right moral, moral model is to encode, in brackets? Um, and follows up by saying, well, perhaps the point it is that this is not a helpful way of thinking about the problem. Thank you, Rob, for asking that question. Um, it gives me the opportunity to slip back to the slide that I skipped over, if I may, Simon. I'm just going to quickly run back. Let me just um, do it this way. It's quicker this way uh, because I think that that is key. Um, so, in in terms of, I agree. First, first answer to your question is definitely yes. Um, uh, I can't do two things at once. I can't control my uh, PowerPoint and talk. Um, that, uh, that there is no consensus. There's no consensus on which moral system, uh, which ethical system should be uh, deployed. Um, the philosophers have argued about it for centuries. They've still not arrived at a, uh, an agreement about it. Uh, and in fact, the situation has got more complex. For each one of those categories I introduced to you, there are lots of different subcategories and lots of different nuances between different systems of ethics that are compared against each other and, and contrasted. So there is no agreement. There's no agreement. Um, so, I mean, choosing one of those is difficult. However, my preference is to go for virtue ethics first. And here are the, here are the three reasons that I wanted to uh, say at, at, at that point in the talk. The first is that action emerges from who we are as human beings. If we want to model the way we are as human beings, and we've already talked about it in the questions, in the answer to some of these questions, what we do comes out of who we are. Our reactions to things, uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we respond to somebody, um, when we decide to tell a lie or whatever, that, that those all come out of who we are. Um, or, or who we've become, should I say, um, over time, who, who we've become in our development of our character. The second thing is, um, ethic, the other ethical theories, the consequentialism and the deontology, focus on the moral value of specific actions or, um, or, or you know, obligations or consequences. But virtue, if you think about virtue and where that comes from, it, it comes from repeated application of ethical dis decision making. We make a decision to respond in a certain way to a, a certain uh, uh, situation and we do that, if we do that repeatedly that becomes part of who we are. That, it's almost like it's compiled into our character um, and, and so that, that's the second reason to me why virtue ethics is foundational. And the third one is linked to that in, in that our character uh, strongly influences what actions we even think about doing. So you if you think about consequentialism, for example, you know, you have an action, you have a choice of actions and, and that you're meant to work out what are the consequences of those actions and then, and then choose one. But before you get to that point, what you would even think about is determined by your character. You know, so I, I could ask, um, I could ask uh, Rob or Ed, you know, what, what would happen, what would you think about if you went into a bank? Would you think about robbing it? Would that be one of the actions on your list of things to do? You know, pay and check, um, uh, be polite to the cashier, and then rob the bank? It, probably not. I mean, it's probably not in your nature to even think about that. Um, so it wouldn't even appear in your list of choices. So to me, virtue ethics and what we would even think about doing is foundational. Um, and then on top of that, you might apply your other ethics. Uh, and it, it's fair to say that this problem is recognized and there are quite a few researchers in this area who are not sticking to one system. Um, some of them have developed systems where you have uh, three different perspectives, one for each of the main categories of ethical theory on, a, on how to respond to a given situation. And you allow uh, those perspectives to vote and, and 
cast a vote on whether to perform that action or not. And then you kind of do some voting system that enables you to actually make a decision. So there's lots of different ways around that. The other thing that I would say about moral theories that is not helpful with robotics is, is they often, they're almost always phrased in terms of you've got one thing, one action to do. You know, you've got to respond to one situation. Whereas a robot, when it's in a real world context, is acting continuously. It's often a sequence of actions that it has to perform and it needs to figure out what is the moral consequence of that sequence of actions um, as it does that. So, yeah, yeah, good, good question. Thank you, thank you for that. And then I'm just going to close with a question from John Evans um, to say, do we have the time to allow AI and robots to learn morals? Won't it take millennia? Um, okay. Well, it, I mean, if, if we, it depends on what your perspective is. So that if your perspective is, um, you know, there's some people that uh, that look at morals from an evolutionary point of view, and that uh, you know they 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 view the development of um, morals over the evolution of the species. And so there's that kind of time scale, uh, and each each individual of that species embodies a version of the, the moral system and the capacity to to be moral, and that develops over time for various sort of drivers within the evolutionary context. Um, so if you were thinking on those scales, then you, yes, it would take it would take a long time to develop. Um, if you're thinking about um, more modestly, if you're thinking about how can I get a robot not to offend people or to do things that are, you know, that are, are questionable in a social context, and you have a well-defined social context, then I could see you could develop that over a much shorter time time scale. Um, it wouldn't be perfect. I don't think any of any of it, any of our systems that we develop end up being perfect. But I think you could do something useful in a relatively short time scale. But there are still, the technology is not there. You know, the, the, that architecture that I presented to you um, very, very quickly, um, this one, this, this is very complex. These systems, each one of these systems is an AI system in itself and they're all collaborating together. And that is gonna take quite a lot of time to even get near to that. This is an ideal situation for me. This is kind of where I see we're heading, maybe 10 years down the line. But at the moment, we still really don't understand, you know, what, how, to, how to get complex behaviors where you've got higher level objectives that might be ethical objectives driving behavior and lower level objectives that, um, that enable a robot to perform attacks. All those things are still being developed. That technology is still being developed as we speak. So, yeah, so I think that we've got a, a little way to go, but uh, hopefully not millennia. <laughs> Thank you. And on, on that, I, I think I'll, and we've gone slightly over time, so I'll draw the questions to a close. Um, probably noticed that Brian turned into me during the talk because Brian, um, uh, Brian was having technical difficulties. There are one or two more questions, but I will capture those and and send them to you if you're willing, Nigel, yes. just so you yes. have the opportunity to see those as well. Um, so it remains for me to, to, to thank you for an extremely thought-provoking um, discussion this evening. Um, very complex topic, uh, very ably explained, and, if, um, uh, and I think the audience will, will have appreciated greatly your, your, your insights into this uh, very uh, topical and complex world that, uh, that you were describing. Um, one of the problems with these virtual meetings is, it, is that we, we, we don't have the facility to easily um, unlock everybody's uh, 
um, audio so that we giving a round of applause from everybody is very difficult but what I'd like what I will do is on behalf of everybody else I'll give you my the applause of the audience and thank you very much for for, for that talk Nigel thank you thank you very much thank you